Night one of WrestleMania, Dallas, Texas, WrestleMania 38, a two-night affair. Night one has been somewhat universally praised. What did you think? I, w- I will join that. I will, uh, I will join that category. I was dreading, obviously, because these things are sometimes four and five hours long. And I was dreading it going in. And after Saturday night was over, that's why I say, you know what? This ain't so bad. This was good. Sunday night, I'm not necessarily looking forward to it like zombie Ed McMahon coming and bringing me my check for winning the lottery, but or the sweepstakes. But uh, I was, you know, I had a heightened sense of optimism after Saturday. Let's say that. Let's talk about Saturday for Let's a while. Let's talk about Saturday. When did you start watching? Um, what, Saturday? I started Sunday morning? Or no, Sunday. did you watch like any of the pre-show stuff with all the talking heads out in front oh, of the stadium? No, I recorded the pre-show, and I, there was no matches on it. It's like the goddamn red carpet at the Oscars or whatever. Well, on no, that I, note, let me ask you one question about that. What do you think about the idea of not doing a dark match on a show this big? Well, I honestly hate dark matches to begin with on big shows because I hate dark matches mostly now on any shows because people have, have, it used to be a dark match. There was one or two matches at a TV taping that wouldn't be taped for television, hence the term dark match. And that was either get the people in the seats at the start of the show to check the equipment run through the audio, announcers do a little call of something, or if you wanted to take a look at somebody that you were considering doing something with in front of a crowd, they're right there in front of you, do it then. Then all the independents thought that dark matches go on house shows. And then they started, and Ring of Honor used to do this. It'd drive me out of my mind. Pre-show matches with... <laughs> well-meaning individuals still in wrestling school that didn't need to be in front of a big crowd. They need to be in front of a lot of small crowds, not a few big crowds. And I never understood that. You're getting people to come to a place like the Hammerstein Ballroom in New York City or or any, I'm just talking about Ring of Honor now, anywhere, anybody's running a big show. And as soon as the doors open and the people come in, they start putting out fucking matches with guys that don't really know how to work and kill the crowd. It's like, what the fuck? We've got people to come to our big show, so we're going to show them the worst wrestling they've ever seen while they're taking their seats and getting their drinks, and then we'll start the show. So uh, dark matches, you know, have been overdone to begin with also. So I don't think they should put a match on WrestleMania before the show starts except if they're doing a two-hour pregame show, then show us some fucking matches. For two hours, you're just going to talk about what we're going to spend four hours watching? Did you ever think of it that way? Uh, I'm going to sit here and watch people talk for two hours about something immediately following that I'm going to watch myself for four more hours. I think there's a lot of people who get really amped up for a big event. I mean, there's a reason why the Super Bowl begins in the morning. You can watch programming all day about the Super Bowl. I never have. Well, you also don't care about the Super Bowl. If you were really a WrestleMania nut job and you were totally into the world of WWE, you probably want to see the guy from the radio (laughs) show and JBL and, and Lawler somehow fit in there and Booker T just give their kayfabe thoughts on various things i don't know i'd like to have heard lawler doing some commentary but i don't want to hear him talking about a show that he's not going to be on oh he was awful on that pre-show he's become the old man who just wants to do jokes um, so no matter what you talk about he's like hey, hey i got one for you what happens <laughs> you know it's like wait a minute whoa we're not doing jokes now but he kept doing it <laughs> all right well saturday night <laughs> night one the they they don't do the national anthem. They do America the Beautiful because Vince doesn't like the national anthem. He doesn't think it's melodic or something. He always does America the Beautiful. And some country guy named Bradley Gilberg did the uh, America the Beautiful. Then they blew the pyro off. And then here come the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders. 
not with anybody. They just came out and danced. They're in Dallas. Okay, I guess people like, for people who like that kind of thing, it's the kind of thing those people like. Then our opening match, and believe me, I wouldn't have watched this except I heard that shit took place. The Usos against Booger and Shaky. And it's not that I don't like the Usos. I've mentioned they, they look great. And they're not bad in the ring, but I can't deal with them as tag team champions when they've also been portrayed as Roman Reigns' flunkies that get beat up on a regular basis by people that are going to be opposing Roman Reigns. They can do one or the other, but I don't think that your top heel tag team should be flunkies in a group with other people. Tully and Arn were not flunkies to Flair. It was a, an association. See what I'm saying? So, anyway, besides that, I don't get anything about Shaky Nakamura. I don't get the whole thing. He looks to me like a, an elderly Japanese Jeff Hardy that is in pain when he moves around. He does very little except twitch and go into spasms. He was a big deal at one time several years ago, right? Yeah, he was great. In New Japan, he was fantastic. What happened? He came up from NXT to the main roster. Well, they got heat on him in this match, and then they did simultaneous tags, and then Booger did his comeback. And I've never met this guy, and I'm sorry he got hurt. Um, I think the I've never seen a stupider gimmick, the way he acts, the way he talks, the the whole presentation of him. I would never watch Booger or Shaky on purpose of my own free will, just because of the way they act. And by the way, on the entrance, he's not playing the guitar. That's a track. He's not playing that. At one point. There's this fucking blistering guitar riff going on, and he's, he puts his hand down and steps through the ropes. He's not even touching the guitar. Right? So I, I don't wish him ill as a person, but this is the just the stupidest gimmick and stupidest portrayal of somebody I've ever seen. But he's making a comeback, and he picks one of them up for the fireman's carry and the other Uso brother comes in and immediately runs and jumps up on his brother's back because the strong man is going to have, for the pop from the people, is going to have both of them up in a fireman's carry and give them some kind of move. Problem is, not only did it look so ridiculous when... The Uso came in the ring and just ran and jumped. Obviously, it wasn't like he was running to be to attack Booger and Booger bent over and scooped him up too. He just ran and jumped up on his brother's back. And then when he landed, this was not necessarily anybody's fault. That's the spot they agreed on. But when he jumps up and comes down all that extra weight, Boogs bends over and tries to get up under him and do whatever he's going to do. and. It was so much weight and awkward, and the and the top Uso started sliding down a little bit off kilter toward the right, and anyway, all the weight went on Boogs' right leg, and his quad tore right off the fucking kneecap. And if you watch this back, because some people were thinking it was his knee, which you would think, but if you watch it back, you can actually see right above his knee pad there is a giant bulge that looks like a well-developed thigh muscle, but right at the kneecap. That's what that looks when that muscle tears, it rolls up like that. So you're actually looking at the guy's muscle torn off the bone, the patella, which is the kneecap. And that ain't good. So he fucking goes down yelling and selling and the referee's like, what the fuck? And he rolls over and tags Nakamura and rolls out on the floor, and we don't see him again except when they shoot it later on when the doctor's assisting him and carrying him out. But they had to... They they did a nice false finish with the Usos 
gets people back into it, and then they called something on the fly and and beat Nakamura. But like I said, the the injury was nobody's fault. And I see the idea that they were going for this guy's really strong and he's powerful and he can pick both these guys up. But again, I've seen, I've seen people try to do this more than I've seen them actually successfully do it. It's an awkward thing to get the guy up there in that position. I've seen guys better catch two guys in a cross body easier or some other thing, but they worked it out, I'm sure, ahead of time. But when they worked it out ahead of time, they hadn't been wrestling. And the guy wasn't tired at all, and nobody was sweaty. And, you know, just five or ten minutes of activity can fatigue the muscles. Everybody's getting sweaty, and they're slipping. Weight goes sideways, and shit happens. And he's... I, <laughs> And, the, and it was so obvious that the guy jumped up into the thing that the announcers called it an offensive move when uh, the guy went down screaming, oh, that was an offensive move by the Usos. It actually looked that way, but if it, they'd successfully done it, it wouldn't have been. So I, I would not have put that spot in at that point. I, I would think there's other ways. He could have double suplexed him. He could have fucking... He could have done the deadlift with both of them. And, and I bet you he would have nailed that, both of them at the same time. Where it went south was having one up and then the other one going up, and that tilted the pile. So how long is he going to be out? Because that he they already sent him to Birmingham for surgery, right? Yeah, that can't be something you come back too quickly from, I don't think. No, I think it's six months or more. At least. But anyway, so they did a package after the match there, the Usos match. And I thought at the time, I wrote, it was Knoxville and Sami Zayn for the following night. But they showed the package because night one, they showed packages of promote matches from night two. And then night two, they showed recap packages from night one. And I wrote, when I saw this, this is the most ridiculous, phony bullshit ever. <laughs> and I fast-forwarded through most of it when it actually happened on these various programs because it was insulting and I didn't want to see it. And I think it actually was worse when I saw it all put together. And did have I mentioned that Johnny Knoxville is an absolute, complete imbecile in every facet of the word? So we got that to look forward to. And then they re recapped the Happy Corbin story from homeless to Vegas to money to mosh pit. And as you'll recall, we've not watched any of that on purpose either because it's so ludicrous. So things were headed downhill. But then they have Drew McIntyre and Happy and mosh pit. Mosh pit's in the corner. What do you think Drew McIntyre has done to piss these people off? <laughs> he was, they were going to make him the top star in the company. He beat Brock Lesnar. He was the world champion. And suddenly they decided, well, we're just going to beat him and take it back. And now we're going to beat him some more. And we're going to put him in angles with goofballs and, and we'll give him a sword. That'll keep people's mind off of it. What the fuck could he have done? to be involved in all of this. I can't explain any of this. I can't explain the booking of Drew McIntyre since fans have come back at all. Well, anyway, happy is worse than the red rooster. As far as g gimmicks go, this is automatically, you don't want to see any of this. And I didn't want to see any of it. Drew McIntyre, you know, nothing wrong with him, but seriously. So we go to the end <laughs> The only thing I cared about was the sword spot. Did you see the slow motion replay? I did. Folks, after Drew and Happy were finished doing whatever they were doing, Drew's in the ring with his sword, and old Mosh Pit decides he's going to get up on the apron of the ring. And this is what I didn't understand. 
Mosh Pit is there on the apron of the ring, and Drew's all the way over across the other side of the ring looking at him. Drew walks over toward him. Mosh Pit just stands there like he's locked in some kind of therapeutic boot apparatus where he can't jump off the apron. His feet are locked to the to the mat, and he lets Drew walk right up on him with a five-foot fucking sword in his hand. And then they stare at each other. And then Drew goes to draw the sword back, and that's when Mosh Pit jumps down to the floor. <laughs> and Drew swings the sword at where Mosh Pit was a second or two ago, and they've gimmicked the ring ropes to where when he hits the, the ropes with the sword, not only do they play a sound effect, but all three ropes are instantly turned loose. I mean, they had a release or wh however they did this. <laughs> the ropes are cut like he cut them with the sword. Boom, boom, boom. But the problem is, is they showed it back in slow motion. <laughs> and the sword is rubber. The sword bent halfway over the fucking ropes before the ropes severed. Did you catch that flippy floppy sword? I think you're underscoring how tough those ropes are. It reminded me of the one time I made the mistake, because we didn't have a real one, of sending Bullet Bob Armstrong out to the ring to make a save with a wiffle ball bat. I said, <laughs> no, I, I said, because it was black. I said, nobody will know, because it was in the locker room at the school. Nobody had a bat. I didn't have a bat. God damn it, there's a bat. Tape it. It looks like a black bat. And everything was fine. Bob can work with a bat. Everything was fine until <laughs> the last shot that he nailed somebody. He got a little too fucking over anxious and hit him pretty good. And then he's standing there doing the fucking promo, holding the bat like a giant toothpick. But you can see the end of the bat is slightly bent. <laughs> 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 but anyway, the fake sword cut the fake ropes with a big sound effect. And Mosh Pit laid there and had a oh shit look on his face. It would have even worked if maybe... Without the slow mo replay, it would have worked better if Mosh Pit had jumped up like he was going to come in, and Drew sees him and runs over to him and swings all in one motion, and boom! And the people would have been shocked, and the ropes, and the but they were just standing there, looking at each other for however long. I didn't. What'd you think? Oh, I didn't. It was happy in Mosh Pit. I didn't care. <laughs> cool spot with the sword. <sighs> And it's what really what it was all about. It was really all about that spot. The match was irrelevant. The the match was just there to set up the sword spot because they had a cool idea, right? Yeah, I think so. But at this point, I'm also wondering, is this show going to be any good? And then it got really good. Yes. Well, not quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, yeah. Um, it got better and, and and certain people got good. The next match was the Mysterios against The Miz and Logan Paul. And okay, this is one that could have been a disaster with an inexperienced celebrity, right? Logan Paul comes out. They never said how much the Pokemon card was worth. He's got a Pokemon card around his neck in a Lucite container on a string and supposedly it's the most expensive Pokemon Pokemon card. And one of these days, I'm going to be interested enough to find out what Pokemon is. I know it's some type of card game, and the, the knowledge ends there. The card, apparently, is, the card is valued at $5.2 million. Well, that's what I found out when I read the internet afterwards. What kind of fucking moron... I got news. I don't care whether he's a boxer, a fighter, a wrestler, a fucking guerrilla warfare commando. You got a $5 million playing card around your neck. I'm going to figure out some way to put you down, motherfucker. <laughs> what the? F Bringing out a $5 million card in a building full of 75,000 people. If, it, if, if Tony Chimmel was still the ring announcer, I guarantee he'd have put that in his pocket and he'd have been out at the fucking casino. But anyway, he's got the $5 million Pokemon card around his neck. Apparently, he bought it. So that, you know, I could even understand Action Comics number one for a couple of million. The first appearance ever of the most iconic superhero of all time. And it's now 
90 years old or whatever, but a fucking Pokemon trading card from 1997. Anyway, this was the, uh, as I said, the Miz and Logan Paul against the Mysterios. And I've got to apologize first. I'm sorry not everybody's relative needs to be allowed to wrestle at WrestleMania. Logan Paul is an athlete, at least. He looks like an athlete. He's had shoot fights. Dominic Mysterio works hard. He can do stuff. You can tell he's put a lot into his wrestling training, but he has put absolutely nothing into his physical training, and he looks like the counter guy at fucking Circuit City. And this is another, and I've, I've, I love his father. Great talent. And I'm, I've never met this kid, and I'm not trying to fucking bury him as a horrible person. But I don't think that he looks visually like a superstar that should be wrestling on the biggest stage in the entire business. Do you? He seems very happy to be there. He seems like he's trying really hard. I think, look, that was the debate when he debuted there. Should he go to WWE right away? They'll own the Mysterio name and he'll be seen right away. Or should he go work in different places, work under a mask, develop himself? He kind of got pushed right to the main roster and there's a place always in wrestling, maybe more so in the past than today, for the smiling, young, good-looking guy. But I said maybe not today. Because it doesn't seem like it gets over the same way it used to. It's a different audience. Different audience well, make but that. hold on now. Terry Taylor was a smiling, good-looking guy and got over in all the territories until he became the Red Rooster. Uh, had good matches, was never the guy. There were a ton of smiling, good-looking baby faces that also... I agree. ...didn't look like they were 17 years old facially and had an athlete's physique. And you may... Maybe a mask would have helped him. Why, since Ray wears a mask, why couldn't Dominic wear a mask? He's still got the same body, but at least you wouldn't see that he looks like a fucking high school kid. I mean, you know, the match was not bad here, and no, I, I'm not saying Dominic sucks, but it just, the visual is hard to take when there's so many good-looking, talented athletes out there. Uh, but Logan Paul... Sign Boy, him. I'll tell you. Sign yeah. him. Sign him now. Yes. It, 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 very shortly after the match started, I said, this guy's got the aptitude for this. A, a nice power slam. He did a blockbuster. He, I mean, he's doing the moves, but also he's not rushing. He's got the facial expressions. And if you notice a lot of the celebrities actually tried to sell shit in a more realistic fashion than some of the wrestlers. You know, but again, I've tried to, I watched The Miz, this is the first time I've really watched a Miz match in a long time. I still don't see anything. I don't understand it, don't get it. But Logan Paul, he could, right now, he could be the top half of the AEW roster. And he's only had one fucking match. So they finally they got some heat on Dominic. It tagged to Ray. He made the big comeback. I like they did the old Midnight Express, Rock and Roll Express, double vertical suplex, knock one guy out into a roll up false finish. I've always liked that spot. Tornado DDT by Ray for a two count, a big pop. And then Logan Paul does the three amigos. And he didn't rush it. You see, to, boom, the first one, he's laying there, and then the leg goes up. And then they realized exactly what he was about to do. And they hated it. And then he hit a beautiful frog splash. And he did the little Eddie dance, and that was the, that was the touch. Yes. He knew what to do. He was great. Yeah. And then <laughs> the finish came. And boy, I wish we could play this and, and dissect it while you're watching the video on the screen, but I'm not sure exactly what was going to happen here. It was close to probably what did happen, but they didn't, they didn't mean to do this. The Mysterios give the double six one nine and hit frog splash and frog splash, right? 
But as soon as Ray hit the frog splash, frog splash, frog splash, Miz was there and grabbed Dom and picked him up for a body slam. And he was apparently, I guess on purpose, going to slam Dominic on top of the pile where Ray was covering Logan Paul, Miz's own partner, somehow to break up the cover. I guess that was odd to begin with because if you slam a guy on top of his partner who's covering your partner, the guy on the bottom gets the worst of it. But Ray hits the fucking frog splash and hooks a leg and starts turning over and his face is looking right up, right as fucking Miz slams Ray's son's ass right onto fucking Ray's face. And you and he sold it and you get everybody well, what the fuck? Did you catch that? I did. I said, what and, the fuck? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, what the and I wrote, what was that supposed to be? And then Miz gets up and gives uh his shitty version of Dennis Condry's full Nelson face buster. One, two, three. So that, uh, you know, I, obviously Logan Paul had to win this thing because they, they've got some money in him with the, the publicity he gets, the following he has, the notoriety, whatever, and the aptitude that he has for this. They need to give him a couple million dollars. Uh, but I bet you that chances are somebody, probably Rey Mysterio, asked everybody in the match not to slam anybody's ass on his face anymore. <laughs> So <laughs> he just picked him up, body slammed him on the man's face. <laughs> God damn it. Anyway, so then Logan Paul and Miz celebrate until Miz looks around and turns around and grabs Logan Paul and gives him the shitty face buster. And then Logan Paul turns over like, well, what the fuck was that? And so I, did you... Under what was their jealousy here of some description? I'm sure that'll probably come out on Ms. TV or whatever, but if it means we're going to get more Logan Paul, even if it's Logan Paul and the Miz, sign me up for that. This guy. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. He had size, athleticism. You mentioned his facial reactions. He was in it. He was treating it like it was an athletic contest. He was in it mentally. If you watched the way he reacted and moved, they had his brother. His brother's also a big social media celebrity. One of them was on a Disney Channel show that my kids used to watch. Then his brother on the pre-show, he's another one. He's got <laughs> size. He was cutting promos. He was talking about his brother's going to kick ass. Sign both of them. I mean, it'll cost a lot, but there's so much you could do. These guys are great as wrestlers. I don't know. They probably would annoy the hell out of me as social media personalities. Oh, yeah. I don't want to speak to any of these people, but... I'll watch him wrestle. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, um, maybe what they ought to do is make Logan, what's his brother's name? Jake. Jake. Oh, my God. Vince May, another Jake, pal? No. Get Logan and Jake and make them the heel tag team champions. That'll draw you some money, but I... I anyway, as and I will be more than happy to watch Logan Paul beat up The Miz also. I'll take that anytime. Anybody that's going to be beating up the Miz, I'll I'll jump on board for that. Well, you know, Jim, I personally wouldn't mind a Miz feud with Logan Paul because I think Miz can be entertaining. He's hit or miss. Sometimes he's really cringy. Sometimes he's really good. At least stuff I've seen, especially on the mic. Now, I also want to hear Logan Paul on the mic to see what they're going to do. But if you want to see the buildup and not hear it because you hate the Miz, maybe you can just listen to something else. I'd like to be listening to something else right now. But <laughs> this, is, this is what I've got to work with. You know, here's an idea. You see all these, all the fighters and the, the mixed martial artists and the athletes and everything. They've always got earphones, earbuds, some kind of ear dressing that they're listening to their own music or their own sound of their own voice or whatever they're listening to. They're in their own world. But you can always tell because they got the stems and the the wires and the cords and the extension cords and they're plugged into the wall, 
you can always tell they got these apparati, that's the plural of apparatus, the apparati in their ear, but with the Raycon everyday wireless earbuds, there's no wires, there's no stems, there's no sticks, there's no seeds. There's just great quality sound inside your head. You can't tell nobody. People standing next to you will not even know that you're not listening to them. You're ignoring the fuck out of them because you got your everyday earbuds in and they look, feel, and sound better than ever. They've even got the new awareness mode for when you need to stop your soundtrack and listen to the, the surroundings, such as the oncoming train, the blowing of the tornado sirens or whatever, and then you get back to music or podcasts, whatever you're watching. The Raycon wireless earbuds also are going to be perfect for the Paul brothers because they never fall out of your ears. I mean, you can shake, you can shimmy, you can move, you can gyrate and gesticulate, you can hang yourself upside down off the monkey bars, you can take a superplex off the top rope. These things will not come out of your... As a matter of fact, people have been buried with these things because they can't get them out of their head. That is not true. You will be able to get them out of your head safely. It's just that they won't pop out frivolously as you're entertaining life on a day-to-day -day yes. basis. No, they never pop out frivolously. And and yes, you're right. The mortician can get them out, but some people... <laughs> That's not what I meant. That's some not people what I meant. prefer to be buried with them because, you know, like a, a fond item or a family heirloom or your Raycon wireless earbuds. Just let's put him in the ground with his ears plugged up. Folks, I'm telling you, you can shake your head till you get brain damage and see sparkly things. These won't fall out. They got eight hours of playtime, 32-hour battery life, you get quality audio at half the price of the other premium audio brands. They've got 48,000 five-star reviews. 47,500 are from Meltzer, but the other people loved them too. <laughs> and right now, our listeners here at the drive through can get 15% off their Raycon order at buyraycon.com slash J-C-E. That's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N dot com slash J-C-E. Save 15% on the everyday earbuds. That's right. And speaking of buds, lots of people have their buds come over and watch WrestleMania. Lots of people may smoke some bud and watch WrestleMania. What else happened on WrestleMania? Well, I'll tell you, bud. Larry Bud Melma. Larry Bud last. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, So after the Mysterio's Ms. Paul match, here comes Stephanie. And she gets to be the McMahon to do the welcome to WrestleMania and all that stuff and everything and introduced Gable Stevenson. It's not Stevenson, as some people say, it's Stevenson. There's no N in there. Um, and he's, of course, the Olympic champion and the guy that they've signed as soon as he gets out of the uh, college, the amateurs, whatever. He came out in an unfortunate knitted form-fitting shirt that looked sort of like a short girl's miniskirt. It wasn't flattering to his form. Um, he looks great, except you would have thought that somebody would have said, hey, Gable, you're going to be on WrestleMania introduced to the WWE audience officially for the very first time. Can you dress? Just dress. Just like you're important somehow. Is that a generational thing where you are you don't care whether you look like a bum no matter what high-profile event you're in? You know, it's a weird thing. It's a generational thing. I think it's also just people don't care anymore. I still like to... I also wear a blazer when I fly. You know, I still wear something nice when I'm in the All air. All right, now, that, now you've got heat with me because I hate those people because you're in a goddamn death tube six miles in the air. Who are you trying to impress? You're sweating like well, a horse. I also like wearing a blazer. I'm not sweating. I have a good blazer, and it fits me nice, and I'm not sweating, Ben. I got lots of pockets. I can hide stuff in, like candy. I could I could be naked on the goddamn airplane, and I'd be sweating because of the lack of air circulation and all those other people's body heat. It's always stuffy and uncomfortable. You were naked on a plane. Everyone else would be sweating, trying to jump off the plane. Well, see, and that have more room for me. <laughs> That's not that what was, I said. That was at the root of my plan. <laughs> All right, we were talking about something with wrestling here. All right, well, it was that nobody wants to dress up anymore. And hey, that's why I don't leave the house, so I can wear my T-shirt and my fucking 
baggy sweatpants and don't have to fucking shave every day. But if I'm going to be at WrestleMania, I'm going to be dressed up. And speaking of dressed up, next was one of the more major stars of the two-night extravaganza, Becky Lynch. Now, she came out, she drives out on the stage in an SUV, the big-time Bex logos. She's got a new hairdo, a great robe. She looks like a star. And here she comes, and then there was a, I, I, they said where they were from. I didn't catch it or jot it down. But there was somewhere around a 70-piece college marching band with tubas and contortionists that came out on stage and played for quite some time. And what did it have to do with Bianca Belair? It was that she's from Knoxville, Tennessee. If it had been the University of Tennessee marching band, okay. But it was just a marching band from somewhere in Texas, and they weren't, they were playing her. You could, I guess it was her music, but I've never heard it on tuba, piccolo, and fucking <laughs> bassoon. You know, bassoon before. <laughs> but here came Bianca Belair, and guess what she was doing? You'll never guess. She was smiling, skipping, and twisting her hair, twirling her hair around. And that is her entrance, and she ain't going to deviate. If somebody has broken into her home, kidnapped all of her children, and burned all of her fucking favorite DVDs, she's still going to be smiling, skipping, and twirling her hair. However, she earned it on this one. Becky Lynch and Bianca Belair for the women's title. If every women's match was like this, then I wouldn't knock women's wrestling. But therein lies the tale. So many of the women's matches are not like this. That's why I suggest that maybe they ought to go for quality over quantity. Instead of having half the matches on a card be women's matches just because they're women, Find some matches that deserve to be there on the card like this one and book those and don't worry about how many there are. You like this one, didn't you? I actually think this may have been the best match of both nights of WrestleMania. I thought this was a fantastic match. You know, I, it, I'll, get I'll get close with you there. It was one of the best matches of both nights of WrestleMania very far up there one of the other matches you may like was probably my second best pick but i do want to say one other thing and i'm dying to hear what you think of this i want to hear your critique we hear all the bad ones this is one that i hoped you liked and it sounds like you did but for everyone that shits on the wwe's developmental and rightfully so in so many cases you know the one thing triple h got right and he did right was develop main event women talent yeah because Becky Lynch is Triple H, Charlotte Flair is Triple H, Bailey's Triple H, Next Generation or Next Crew, Bianca, Rhea, that's all Triple H. So, you know, there may not be the Ortons and the Cenas, but the one thing they actually did, even better than they did with the guys for, by far, <laughs> but they actually developed main event wrestlers in the women's division, and that's something to, that's something to really be proud of, actually. And they were on here. And and they got they all got it or they both got it right. Becky Lynch was aggressive because she felt like she was the wronged party, but Bianca Belair came back in it. They, it seemed like that a struggle that they were going for something. It was it was a contest, and and you know it just I'm not going to recount blow for blow here, but observations Bianca Belair can sell and her shit looks good. Uh, at one point, she did a modified gotch lift. One arm with Becky, and both of them fell over the top rope. Bianca giving Becky a vertical suplex on the floor, even though both of them sold it. It just in the middle of the match. I, that's a little much. But if the if the worst thing that I can say is, well, they shouldn't do vertical suplexes on the floor and then go another fifteen minutes or whatever, this was a good match. At one point, I think Becky may have been leading it she's the heel i don't know if they still do that these days in the modern world um i saw they got just they got just a touch discombobulated and got back on track and then right after they got back on track 
Did you see the cannonball off top? Becky Lynch goes to the top. She's going to do one of those cannonball moves into Bianca, I guess, to end up sitting on her chest or whatever. But Bianca was either too far out or Becky's rotation was too tight, and she did a forward flip cannonball off top rope and kicked Bianca right in the fucking face. <laughs> and then and they showed the slow-mo, her heel went right in the mush. And if you watch the original shot... With Leo when they, Namalini. Uh, when, when you watch the original shot they took of it, you see Becky fall and immediately look up and go, oh my God, and she goes to cover Bianca, but she's actually, are you still alive? And they took a second there, and then they got it together. Uh, but that was a hell of a potato. Hey, if you're going to botch a move like that, that actually made it look more devastating. Well, yeah, and then the announcers could say, well, I've never seen that before, a, a flipping drop kick to the face. And they went reversals and false finishes back and forth. Bianca went for the finish, but Becky overbalanced and, and she dumped her over the top rope. But then Bianca threw her back in and she rolled out the other side and grabbed Bianca's hair and pulled her into the post by the hair. I wrote, this is great in capital letters. Again, Becky Lynch slams her on the metal stairs, flat of her back. Boom. She beat the count at nine, and that got a pop, and Becky had a cow. But again, geez, you know, enough injuries already. I liked the finish, and it got a big pop. Becky goes to pull Bianca up, and Bianca backflips off the turnbuckle and gets Becky up in her finish and hits that, boom, out into a one, two, three, big pop. Great match. You know, that, um, I, I apologize for raising my eyebrows and farting in your general direction when you, oh, watch Bianca Belair. She's good. She's good. I've seen her a few times. She wasn't bad, but this, she was really good. And Becky was excellent. This match was really good. Becky was excellent. Becky, from the moment she comes out there, again, we have never seen this haircut before, but she's got a look. She's a star. She carries herself like a star. It's funny that Bianca, no matter what's always smiling, and doing the dance with the hair, no matter what. This is a grudge match. <laughs> no matter what. But beyond that, you know, she's got size. She's strong. She's athletic. Pretty. I mean, she's... I remember telling you way back in NXT, I said there were two people there. You were just focused on Rhea Ripley. And I agreed with you about Rhea Ripley. But I said, keep your eye on Bianca Belair. And unfortunately, she's been used a lot better than Rhea Ripley. Not unfortunately for Bianca or her fans. Yeah. But unfortunately for Rhea Ripley, she hasn't been used anywhere near as well as Bianca Belair has. But again, Becky Lynch, com Becky Lynch and Bianca Belair are main event stars. And there aren't that many. <laughs> yeah. And they're getting fewer and farther between all the time. Um, who was the bunch that came out to the stage next? There was 40 people in cowboy hats going, oh, to start. The Seth music. Who was was that? The Morbin Tabernacle Choir or the the Morbid Tabernacle? The Morbid. Choir? Yes, I don't know. So here comes Seth entrance. Seth Seth freaking Rollins. As we now that that freaking is just installed in the middle of his name. The announcers can't just say one; they have to say all three. Seth freaking Rollins. The commentators say it nonstop throughout the match. Yeah. I understand you want to say the guy's whole name, Seth Rollins. You don't want to just say Seth or Rollins, but that to say the whole thing, Seth freaking Rollins, every single time you mention him is ridiculous. Well, it's actually when you have to say a guy's full name, even if he doesn't have freaking in the middle all the time, it's ridiculous because you've established, and I'm I sure I've heard football announcers call the football players by their last name when they're in the middle of a play. When I did commentary for Dennis once years ago, Dennis Carluzzo for those one word, <laughs> I won't say who, because he was a nice enough guy, but I did commentary with someone, and every single time he handed it over to me or said something to me, it was Brian Last. Hey, Brian Last, what do you think of this power slam there, Brian Last? <laughs> and I didn't have the guts to say, or I didn't have the heart to say, please don't do that, but... Heart, guts, spleen, kidneys. <laughs> 
So anyway, Seth comes out, the feathered robe. He's swimming down the aisle. Did you see the, the, he was doing the breaststroke, I think, at one point. And there was a sign in the crowd, all roads, R-H-O-D-E-S, all roads lead to Seth, which I thought was witty. So then the time, as they say, has come. Music drops, dramatic pause, milking, more milking, <laughs> pyro, blackout, wide shot. What did the voice say that they played in the arena right before the music hit? I heard his voice say something. I could not tell what the something was. I don't know either. I thought maybe he said something about WrestleMania. And I thought it was Cody, but I wasn't even certain of that because I couldn't I think tell. It's, it, I think it's Cody's voice, and they played something over the PA right as the music was to start. He was making some type of statement. The people in the crowd reacted to it, but I went back, turned the volume up, couldn't understand it on the broadcast. So that may have been a, a clue of what, <laughs> as Finkel it? would say, his demeanor is going to be or something, whatever pithy statement he made, but I couldn't hear it. So the music starts. It's Cody's music. Cody apparently owns his music. And of course, uh, Vince doesn't like to pay rights or use any music that doesn't come from in-house. And he makes the periodic exception for punk in that contract thing that time for cult personality, for Ronda Rousey, bad reputation. He won't do it often. I've heard from his own lips. We don't pay for music, pal. But in this case, Cody has to own it, and he was able to bring his AEW music over to the WWE, and you know Vince had to love that. So I don't. I, that probably came as part of the package. I don't think Vince is paying for it. But when's the last time you heard the same guy's music in two different promotions of this? I mean, yes. Yeah, the guy's a couple weeks playing. ago. When? Jeff Hardy. Oh, shit, that's theirs too, isn't it? Well, then there you go. What Does Tony Khan have a music lawyer that should be protecting him from all these things? Tony Khan has licensed music. The Jungle Boy theme song is Baltarama. The Baltimore, not Baltimore, Baltarama. Excuse me. Either way, he sucks. It's Bananarama is who you're thinking Bananarama were good. Uh, also, he has the Pixies for Orange Cassidy. Well, yes, I'm not saying he won't license it, but the thing is, he's letting the guys use their own music, not trademarking it, and then they can be free to fly away and use their own music in other companies. And by the way, I'm happy about that, because I actually think Cody coming out to that music helped set the tone, it helped make the statement, actually. Oh, it was huge, yes! Cody Rhodes looked more like a big-time star and a major main event money ball player on this entrance and in this match than he ever has before. And yes, the music was part of it because it was instantly recognizable and to people it added to their absorption of the whole thing. But again, Tony's playing this shit on his television show and suddenly not only does one of his EVPs leave, but he can take his music with him and everything. It's, it's, I mean, they've just wiped their feet on poor old Tony's face this week. So, but anyway, the American Nightmare rose through the stage. It's the same thing, but it's a huge crowd, and it's a new coat of paint, and it's in a different environment. Remember, we talked about this. Even uh, Kevin Nash, Diesel, was the lowest-drawing WWF champion in WWF history up to that point in time, 1995. He goes to WCW. It's a new environment, and they think it's part of an invasion. And he's one of the biggest stars in the business. You know, another big thing I think that was important, Cody came out there, popped through the stage, got his pop, started walking to the ring. No turning around and looking for Arn Anderson, no yeah. Brandy, no Dustin, no one. And I think that was important too, because Cody, on his own going to the ring, that also, if all of a sudden there was someone else by his side, it would have changed it. Yeah, because that's when the, the AEW worm started to turn, when it w became constant with these entourages and these processions and these multiple corner people and everybody in my 
family and immediate social circle of friends is all going to come to the ring with me. And, 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 and now with Brandy, all that stuff is what started the ball rolling on people, not particularly giving a fuck about Cody or giving a fuck about him in the wrong way. So now it was just him. He had the crowd. He's over huge pop, big walk down. The announcer saying from undesirable to undeniable. I th this this may have been his uh, ulterior motive, his plan for the last six years. I'm going to go somewhere and make Vince McMahon sorry that he didn't see what I see in me and he didn't put the title on my daddy in the garden. I think that's a large part of it. And so, and now, you know, thank you for Kate took a little detour, but I mean, because let's face it, Maybe they would have placated old Twinkle Toes, old Kenny. The WWE would have given him a contract and some money, and they would have put him on the roster. And personality-wise, if nothing else, even if you think that Kenny Olivier is the world's greatest living wrestling artist, the WWE, they might have used him in the ring, and he might have been able to do some shit in the ring, but the person that he is and the personality that he is and the personality you need to have to get to the top in the WWE, I guarantee you either Vince himself or somebody close underneath him would have run that son of a bitch off in about six months. They would have sh sh washed their hands of him as a person who didn't get what the fuck was going on around him in, in the wrestling business. And the Hardly Boys, I'm sure they would have been willing to give them money too if they made an offer to them, as, as they claim, when AEW was still in the imagining stages and the formative stages, just to get them to not go there. But do you think <laughs> that in any way, shape, or form, either one of the Cucamonga kids would have been featured on top or allowed to do any of the horse shit that they do working for Vince McMahon. You know, I don't want to go too off topic here, but I will say I did have the thought watching this, and it may have been around this match now that I think of it, that it, the thought popped into my head, that I've been saying how Kenny Omega feels more at the world champion AEW than Adam Page ever has. And he did. And he does. Yeah. And I don't think he would have fit into this at all. Cody... You see him in there with Rollins right away. It was a different Cody than we saw in the entire run of AEW, I felt. And I don't know if Omega fits into this system. And he would probably say, you know, he doesn't fit into the system. Yeah. I don't think he fits into that system at all. See, that, that's the point I was making before we talk about the match. Um, is just that of all the executive vice presidents, the former members of the Bullet Club or whatever, Cody is the only one that could have hopped companies and actually done this be on top be in a main event situation and deliver and get along with and work in the wwe harpo old twinkle toes old kenny he couldn't do it because one side or the other would have been uh, in a mental meltdown over what the fuck's the matter with this fucking guy from the office side or kenny may very well have braided his hair and wrapped it around his neck from having to deal with them because he's off on his own planet. So that would not have been a, a fit personality wise. And with the bucks, no, they would never be featured on top in this company or be allowed to do any of that shit. And they knew it. That's why they didn't take the offer. And that's why they didn't go. And that's, and they knew the offer was just to keep them from being involved in a startup company. And, and that was never going to be offered again. But, you know, no, Cody's the only one of that group that could actually come here and do this and be a star. And that's what he did. And that's why the others are probably pissed at him now. And that's why the Cucamonga kids are changing their Twitter profiles to, to knock Cody. What do the kids call it? Passive aggressive? When you're too much of a pussy to just come out and tell somebody what you think of them? 
and you do it on the sly and behind people's back, that's called passive aggressive. That's what now the Hardly boys are doing to Cody because he's in the big time and they're not. And people are starting to see through them. Well, that's their game too. I don't want to get, I don't want to go too off, but you know, Shawn Michaels was a to your face dickhead with them. It's a passive aggressive shit. There's enough guys who have experienced it and have talked about it. Maybe not openly that it's a real thing, but anyway, another topic for another time. All righty, so this match, two smooth veterans doing wrestling, back and forth. Um, they did the vertical suplex spot over the top rope. I mentioned this. Somebody did it three or four weeks ago. I said, well, they did it safely. This one may have been even better, and Cody took the worst of the bump. He landed hard. Cody had something to prove here, and he was proving it. The Seth started the heat when Cody came off the top. Seth drop kicked him in the ribs, and then, yeah, welcome back to the big leagues, bitch. And I'm sure a bunch of the trampoline cowboys over on the other side of the fence were just, oh, you no good son of a bitch. How dare you say that? Uh, a little heat. Cody came back. Clothesline over the top. A dive, and he hit Seth, and Seth took a backflip over the announce desk. One bobble. Cody did that turnaround crossbody off the top, and he was headed downwards. Almost missed it, but he saved it. Uh, they both saved it. And then he came off the stairs for a Hurricane Rana, and Seth almost lost him, but he caught him, and he saved it and buckle-bombed him into the rail. And the, it just, it was a great match. They had more heat and more comeback and false finishes. And finally, Cody, the big comeback, the end, crossroads, two count, big pop. And they go to the, they've always got to go to the buckle. Everybody's got to go to the buckle. And he spent a while there, but Seth, ended up giving Cody an inverted or upside down, for those of you who don't understand inverted. I don't understand why you'd go for this move. Superplex off the top rope, which it, lo is, is, it looks and is even more dangerous than a regular superplex, but it looked beautiful. But then they didn't let it register because it popped right back up into that Falcon Arrow bullshit. Have I mentioned that that's one of my pet peeves? I've told you about Vince's. One of mine is a superplex off the top rope where both guys immediately come right back up and do another fucking smaller suplex. But nevertheless, more back and forth. They couldn't get the double bridge in at that point. They were deep in the match, but then Cody hit the Cody cutter off the top rope, and that was a pretty thing. They, I mean, the, they were right on with most everything. Boom, two count. Then Rollins hits a pedigree two count. Big pop on that one, because they thought that might be it. And they did a nice one-two exchange with some body English and language to it. Seth went to the ribs, and then he did those face kicks where he grabs the guy. What do they call them? Kawada kicks? Is that from... Uh, yeah, from Toshiaki Kawada. Toshiaki Kawada. Well, I bet you he was stiff too, but these didn't look too... Cody, at the end of the goddamn match, he had fucking... Not only just welts on his face, but it looked like boot prints on his forehead. So they they were, uh, they were laying it in here. Uh, Cody hit the crossroads out of nowhere, then a second one. Then did the dusty jabs and the flip-flop and fly bionic elbow, and the place went nuts. Nice little nostalgia business there. Hits the third crossroads. One, two, three. Huge pop. This audience, is it? are they loving Cody because it's Cody and the presentation, or are they loving Cody because now they get to fucking crow about taking somebody away from the... Because all the AEW fans now and all the WWE fans are circling the wagons. One hates the other. They both say that the other company's matches are shit. Both of them usually are right. Uh, but now, are, is this going to be a deal where, unless they fuck up the booking some kind of way or Cody brings back his entourage, Cody's already a made man's going to be over just because they get to... Lord won over the AEW folks? What do you think? I don't think that will have too much to do with it because I think such a small segment of the WWE audience 
is tribal like that. There's an element of it, of course. Well, but everybody is a bigger element. Tribal, it's WrestleMania. So these are the most tribalistic people. This ain't just Des Moines on a Friday. These are the people that are flying to a place so they could pop nonstop. And <laughs> the plan is Boy, for 40- I, I know a couple of places like that. You don't need to fly to them. Just pay the hourly rate. You could pop nonstop. The reaction to Cody was fantastic. It's all he could have hoped for. And they have him slotted to be a baby face on Raw, from what I hear. But when you get away from that traveling audience, that'll be the test. How do the fan? I think the question may be more how do the fans in WWE take to him as a main eventer than it is will they continue the booing? The only fans who would be doing that are fans who are watching AEW. So it'll be interesting to see how the crowd reacts after tomorrow after tonight as we're recording after raw if the fans tonight start booing him and setting that precedent and the other fans see it you don't know if vince sees that you don't know but cody got off to a fantastic start he came across like a star yeah. hey let me put seth rollins over because i hate his gimmick more than anything in the world Gr- great match though great match and when he stood there and he didn't know who his opponent was and he got serious for a second, and you looked at his face, and he was concerned. I believed in that guy. I kind of wanted to see what was going to happen. I don't need the fake Joker laugh all the time. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that's been the thing that I've liked about him since I met him in Ring of Honor. He can work his ass off, and for a guy that tall, he's physically, he can do a lot of incredible things, and he can have great matches, and then just every time they have him speak or portray him in these fashions, it's counterproductive. But yes, Cody, back welted, face welted, beat up, but he got the ovation. He's over with the people, and they're still in Dallas tonight for Raw. They're still in with the WrestleMania audience and ambiance. I hope they we, get it right. And they're in Texas, and the Rhodes family in Texas. You're right. So. I'm thinking it'll be a week or two until they go to a normal place in the United States of America. If there are any anymore, where just reg- a regular crowd of people come to see a wrestling match. Wait a minute, what am I saying now? Regular people don't even watch wrestling anymore. But we'll see what happens when it's not the the most devoted of the devoted, and it's just a regular town and a regular WWE crowd, and we'll see you know, how they respond to him then. And it's important to note the fans in AEW wanted to respond to him that way. And initially they did. He wasn't just some WWE guy. He was a guy that aligned himself with the Bucks and became part of their movement and got him there. And early on they did. The problem was when all of a sudden weird things would get introduced into programs or weird programs or promos that went nowhere or Cody would show up and then disappear for weeks. I have to think all of that's going to be out the window now. So. The biggest disappointment of Cody and AEW on camera is the way he was used. Yeah. Because it never made sense, and it was disjointed. And at a minimum, the disjointedness should probably go away now because he's going to be on that show every week. Well, and plus, they're, the WWE machine, the producers, the people in various places will keep him from going out and sounding so grandiose and glorious about himself that he gets that kind of heat i was gonna say i saw a interview he did backstage after the match like right after the match they sent a girl up to him right away with a microphone he's covered in sweat and blood and whatever else he looked he looked like he was in a fight it looked great yeah and it was the best interview i've ever heard him do and it wasn't in front of the fans and it wasn't that kind of interview but he sounded so real and so genuine and i thought back to the last interview we heard him do an aew on tv that weird so what do you guys want to talk about? And I didn't get the contract I wanted. Like, it got to a weird point in AEW. And this is a chance to kind of start a new And when I saw that interview backstage, you know, you, you see that and you're like, I like this guy. I want this guy to succeed here. So it'll, well, be, it, it'll be interesting to see how long they can ride the goodwill. Dusty was the son of a plumber. Dusty Rhodes, he had, he could touch common average people he could talk to them they would get behind him he looked like one of them even in the 70s when he was wearing the furry robes and the psychedelic outfits and everything it was 
it's always dusty whether he was the cowboy and the boots and the jeans or the psychedelic stuff in the 70s or whatever at the at the root of it dusty Rhodes was a fucking redneck that came into money and everybody could identify with that and they liked him for it and they got with him and that's the way he came off and he didn't like i said a couple shows ago if he did use a word with four or five syllables it was one that he had made up and you knew what he meant even though it wasn't a real word but it's that you know but cody has been the rich grandson of a plumber he's got an entourage he had a bus he had a reality tv show and he's using the real big words in their real context and he got two Big for his britches, as Mama Cornette used to say, in the fans' eyes, I think, or two. It was like he was dabbling in wrestling while he was a reality show star and an international celebrity and man of mystery. And that took him out of the the place that Dusty had for so long in people's minds, which was this fucking guy that he's done his own thing and he he don't care, he's comfortable with himself, he's a big fat slob and he kicks ass and we love him. It wasn't the same. But anyway, we shall see if they keep, in the WWE, if they keep Cody away from coming off like Richie Rich instead of the grandson of a plumber. Of course, if Cody and Brandy think back to previous times and they want to commemorate those times maybe you don't want to get some photography maybe you don't want to i guess it would really be just photography maybe you just don't want to do that you want to get an oil painting maybe you don't want to sketch yourself oh there's that maybe you don't want to uh you know use your face to cut some gorilla cookies maybe you just <laughs> maybe you just want an oil painting no i would think that with all the pictures that the private photographers, the personal photographers have taken of Cody and Brandy and their extended family and entourage that they've got plenty of photographs that they can send to the folks that paint your life and they will get a giant hand-painted, custom-made portrait that they can hang on their wall and they can relive those memories forever of when they were all together on the nightmare bus that Tony Khan got for them. What a great idea. If you've got a family member or a friend or even someone you don't care about, but you want to make them feel bad, get them something nice and they'll feel guilty. Whatever it is, birthdays, anniversaries, weddings, paintyourlife.com can take any photograph or combination of photographs and their team of world-class artists will turn them into a custom-made hand-painted portrait. You can get the picture in as little as two weeks. And they will work off of anything, yourself, your kids, family, special place, lost loved one, cherished pet, even an action shot. Whatever action you may be getting, we're not going to be the ones to judge. You send that picture to paint your life, and after they make multiple copies to laugh at you in their warehouse. They don't do that. Don't even say that. They do not do that. They do not do that. You will not know a thing about them doing that. They will no, they the don't and do that. You will they not don't do it. That's you won't know a thing about the thing they're not going to do. They won't. You won't know a thing about the thing they're not doing. And there's no risk on this. At PageYourLife.com, if you don't love the final painting, your money is refunded, guaranteed. And right now, as a limited time offer, you can get 20% off your painting, 20% and free shipping if you text the word DRIVE, D-R-I-V-E, to 64,000, that's drive, to 64,000, 20% off. As a matter of fact, if you have all of your family members painted in the nude instead of clothing, you can get 25% off. No, you can't. they don't have to go through all that extra detail. There is no extended nudity discount. Don't tell people that. Well, I, that's different than the information I got, but, but wait a minute. Maybe I'm thinking of, a, of another company. Yeah, I think so. I don't know what information yeah. you have. What information do you have? Well, I had information that this one time you go in naked, you get in free. But that may have been a club rather than... There was a door charge if you were clothed. But uh, And, and fortunately, I got 15% off because I had a handcuff key in my pocket. But anyway, at paintyourlife.com, 
<laughs> As I mentioned, there's no risk. Everything is done covered and safe. Uh, and you'll get your painting and you'll love it. You'll hang it on the wall and you'll hug it and squeeze it and call it George forever. Paintyourlife.com. Celebrate the moments that matter most. Message and data rates may apply. Terms apply. Available at paintyourlife.com slash terms. Keep your clothes on, cowboy. You know, you brought up the bus before. And Cody obviously was at WrestleMania in a bus. He had his family there, had some other people there. And I believe I heard, I got to go back and check. It's been a long weekend. That in the post-Mania media scrum, now they're doing it. He said that Vince actually gave him a bus as one of the things in the negotiation. And it made me laugh because if that's true, he wanted punk money from Tony, but he wanted punk perks from Vince. Because wasn't <laughs> punk the one who got a bus years ago? I don't know. I didn't know that if punk was a bus fan or not. I think punk, I, I, I could be no, wrong. No, no, no. Brock got a bus. I think punk got a bus too. No, Brock got a plane. Vince gave Brock a plane? Well, no, Brock got a plane. Oh, that's on his own. It, what you do on yeah. your own, it's your own business. Well, yeah, I'm just trying to match the star to their method of conveyance or transportation. So Brock had a plane. Maybe Punk got a bus. Why? I don't want the goddamn bus. I want a nice SUV is fine because then you can park anywhere. You can go through the drive throughs I don't want to sleep on the goddamn thing anyway. But Cody must like buses. I think he just wants to have his family with him. Boy, that's another weird thing. What? Isn't the whole idea of getting into wrestling business to get away from your family? Well, he has a family now, and they're... Well, most of the guys in the wrestling business had a family. They were anxious to get away from. For heaven's sake. It's nice he got a bus. <laughs> I guess so. Well... And Luger got a bus. You see where that went. Hopefully Vince stays in love with Cody a little bit longer than Lex, but... You know what? Lex was not allowed to to actually take the bus anywhere he wanted to go. He had to get on the bus and drive the bus, or not drive the bus, ride on the bus all across drive the country. The bus. <laughs> well, he might have snuck up there once or twice, but he had to ride all across the country to do those promotional appearances, and he was about as comfortable as a fucking man with his ass on fire in the depths of hell on that bus. What was next? Uh, I don't know. You have the list in front of you. Oh, I've got notes. The Hall of Fame inductees were introduced. Taker music and entrance, and he went to both sides of the stage, got the big ovation. They did a package on Pat McAfee. I've always loved McAfee's packages. And they had footage of him training with Rip Rogers in his barn in Indianapolis. Did you see Rip? Or did you look that close? I, I did see Rip. I was looking for Rip, actually, specifically. As soon as I saw the barn, because Rips tweeted pictures of him and McAfee in the barn, as soon as I saw the barn, as Rips in there somewhere. Then they announced the attendance, 77,899. However, on the opposite side of things, uh, Uncle Dave has just reported it was actually 4,274. So there's some discrepancy there. We're going to try to get the final numbers as soon as possible. And here we come. This one has been long awaited. Ronda Rousey versus Charlotte Flair for the women's title. One of the women's titles. We just had another women's title. That's, that's another thing. How do you think Bianca Belair and and uh, um, Becky it, Lynch? Mr. Becky Lynch, thank you. I went blank for a second. How do you think they felt their big WrestleMania moment and they're in one of the two women's title matches? <sighs> however the referee they, was oh, go ahead i was gonna say and they were in the better one well yeah and and it was and uh, again this is rousey and charlotte probably contributed more to selling tickets or getting views or pay-per-views if anybody but me still buys those or whatever because it's a marquee match with the major names but bel-air and Becky had the advantage of not only going on first, but also both of them being pretty accomplished workers. Whereas, you know, Charlotte's great, but she's not a magician. And Ronda Rousey's had 32 matches. So each one of them had their, their, their bragging rights. We had a better match, but they drew the money, whatever. 
But uh, the referee, I think there should have been a complaint lodged. Did you see the referee, Charles Robinson, little Nate, a guy who thinks that Charlotte Flair's father is the greatest human being to ever walk the planet is the referee? This smells like a conspiracy. Apparently, I was the only one that noticed that. Someone call Stephen Pinu. I don't know what you want me to do to help them. Uh, <laughs> so what is the deal again with Ronda Rousey's eye makeup? I'm not sure I understand. She looks like, you know, she was a fucking cast member reject of the Outer Limits. She just landed from some spaceship. Um, Charlotte looks when she comes out and gets in the ring, she looks like the biggest female star in wrestling uh, because she acts like it and she thinks she is and therefore the prophecy somewhat fulfills itself. But at least Rhonda after she got in the ring, had the mean face on instead of smiling. Michael Cole said Ronda Rousey's debut match was four years ago at WrestleMania. I thought it was three years ago at WrestleMania. Who's right? I thought it was longer than that. Hold on, let me check. Yeah. I'm pretty much going to guarantee you that it was 2019. Checking, checking. I wish we had the Jeopardy music. Da, 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 da. I'm checking here. It's For some reason, the first thing that came up was actually not that, but when she appeared at WrestleMania with The Rock before that. It was the it was the match with um, Stephanie and Triple H and her and Angle. It was at the stadium in New Jersey. I swear the year was 2019. It may be. WrestleMania 34. Okay. Well, no. That ain't it, because that would be four years. It was not four years ago. Okay, I don't know. Well, God damn it! can you not Google into the Googler This Google machine? sucks. Hold well, on. Get a, get a different Google. Get a good Google. WrestleMania. <laughs> it was in New Jersey, in the stadium, and it was in April of uh, 2019. I'm going to bet you money. Well, <laughs> it was WrestleMania 34. What year? 2018. Well, God damn it. New Orleans. I was right. You had me go off the one I had that was right. No, they were in New Orleans in 2014. And again in 2018. Ah, oh, well, fuck. Well, they shouldn't repeat themselves. All right. Anyway, this match was a fight. And if you noticed, every match... On this card, except, what did we, we skipped something, or did we skip something? Yeah, the multiple man thing. But every match on the card, you know who the baby face is and who the heel is. It's not a tumbling competition. It seemed like a contest, like people were struggling for something. The biggest company on the biggest show of their year, you know, it, it, the guy, the talent stepped up. Even though it the booking ahead of time was nothing to write home about, and a lot of people have been presented in serious or in in not in non serious, a lot of people have been presented in frivolous fashion. But the talent took this seriously, and you understood what was going on for the most of it. Again, Rousey, she's not experienced, but with just one opponent instead of being in a battle royal where she got lost and wandered around, or instead of a, a multiple-person situation, it's easier. Charlotte can help her out a little bit, and Rhonda has been a mixed martial artist, so as far as a fight goes, whether it's a legitimate competition or a worked competition, she kind of gets that one-on-one, I'm-against-you type of thing. She used the judo throws. Uh, you know, Charlotte controlled most of this, but Rhonda would get in her things that people want to see her do. Uh, it, it was not smooth all the way through. Um, and Charlotte went for her double moonsault and missed both of them. Uh, one on purpose, one by accident. But uh, I like that deal where she hung Rhonda in the tree of woe in the turnbuckle and then got up top and put the Boston crab on her in, in the buckle while she was upside down. Then Rhonda sits up and judo throws her off the top. And it, it wasn't smooth, but at the same time, it, it looked like people fighting to get an advantage. 
Uh, Rousey with the ankle lock. Charlotte reversed it. Ronda kicked her into the buckle there and then kind of got lost and paced around a little bit. But Charlotte hit another big move for a two count. Ronda get the ankle lock again. They traded some stiff kicks, and Charlotte goes first time for the figure eight with a really deep, wild bridge on that, and Ronda reversed it and got the reversal of a figure four, and both of them roll out to the to the floor. So Charlotte takes a hard bump. Well, actually, no, Ronda rolled out. Charlotte's on the apron, and Ronda jerks her off the apron and throws her onto the fucking floor. She hit hard. Ronda was going to run toward Charlotte on the on the floor so that Charlotte could catch her and do the SOS, the Scott Hall fallaway slam into the barricade. And this would just green this. Ronda runs, and instead of coming with a crossbody where she could catch her, she kind of dove with her head going past her, and the, the balance was off. But she says, Charlotte saved it. Um, Ronda hit a Piper's Pit and got the one, two, three, but as soon as the three came down, Charlotte had gotten a foot on the ropes, and Robinson waved it off. Oh, no, no, I, I, he saw it just in the nick of time. It didn't quite have the artisticness as when Tommy Young used to do it, but he got the point across. Again, Charlotte comes back on the offense. And then finally, Charlotte's going for a step over to get, like she's going to go into the figure four and Ronda's supposed to kick her off. So she goes into the, into the referee and into the turnbuckle. But again, greenness, Ronda, and she just rushed it. She rushed the kickoff. And as a result, she missed. She pushed over Charlotte's ass the first time. Charlotte, expecting a push, started going forward then realized it wasn't the push, and then Rhonda gave her a quick second push, and she had to bobble a step and go into the referee. Aspiring wrestlers out there, there's an easy way to do this and an easy way to communicate with your opponent ahead of time on getting the timing on this. When you've got the guy's leg and you're about to do the step over where you turn your back and expose your ass to the fucking guy on the floor's face so he could kick you off, always tell him, I'm going to have your leg and I'm going to swing my left leg over and plant my left foot. When I plant my left foot, I will be braced with slightly knees bent so that I'm ready to push off and I'm going to stop for just one second in the turn and the planting of the foot so it doesn't look like I'm waiting on it. You need to have your foot not on my ass cheeks, but straight in my taint, because that's where you're not going to slip off and push then. Otherwise, it always gets fucked up and it looks hokey when somebody's gotten a little breeze of a push and runs full steam into the fucking corner. Nevertheless, at that point, Charlotte spears the referee because she got kicked off. Rhonda gets her arm. Charlotte's tapping. There's no ref. Rhonda goes to get the referee, turns around. Charlotte comes with the big boot. One, two, three. Holy shit. And as I've, I wrote, what a fight. Not as good a wrestling match as Becky and Bianca, but a stiffer fight between the two of them. It was, it, even with some herky jerkiness. This was good enough to be in its spot on WrestleMania. That's my thoughts. I don't think it was bad or anything, but whatever, because of where it was on the <laughs> card or because of everything we just saw, I wasn't that into it and nothing about the match pulled me into it. I wasn't, I saw some people try to excuse the sloppiness. It was sloppiness. It was sloppy. I couldn't really get into this match. I have not really gotten into Ronda Rousey's return at all. It's missing something. Well, it's missing a lot. Well, we've talked about uh, it, it, all the things that it's missing, and some of the things maybe is beyond their control, but some of them they could have controlled. Uh, but it comes down to she was protected before, and she's not been as protected this time around with exposing the things that she can't do just because she's not done this 
often enough. Again, you know, maybe I'm just grading on what I've, all I've watched over the course of this weekend and girls' matches in general, but these two female matches, women's matches, um, I could take this, either because of the talent in the, in the wrestling or the star power in this case. I could take it, but I don't want to see five girls in a ladder match. But you're, you're right. The clock is ticking on Ronda before a lot of people figure out, you know, she's not really as good as we thought she is, and she doesn't really beat anybody in a minute anymore. But that's, you know, to be expected. But it's your show. <laughs> well, we're not done with night one of WrestleMania. Oh, well, that was the main event, but that wasn't the last thing. Because the last thing was a talk show, the KO show. I mean, this is, obviously, this is what people were waiting for. And they were chanting Austin before Owens even said a word. But he comes out in the, you know, meager little set in the ring, the KO show, the signs and et cetera. And he did a good promo to start this thing out because Owens can talk. He doesn't sound like he's reciting lines or had a script memorized or somebody told him to say these things. He sounds like he's coming up with it off the top of his head and just with the little asides and, you know, uh, uh, inflections that he puts in and the way he sometimes, oh, I got an idea, you know, just it's natural. And he, you know, ranted at the Texans. He apologized for telling the truth about their pathetic state. And then he ran Austin down, said he was going to pour beer down his throat. There was nothing Austin was going to be able to do about it. And the music, the glass breaks and hits and inter interrupts him, and the babies come in the air. And here comes Austin. And he looks basically the same. He, he, it, he was bald, so it doesn't matter if he lost his hair because nobody would know. He's the same weight. His arms look good. His he he looks like Stone Cold Steve Austin. If you get a close up in high def, you can tell he's got a little more age on his face, and he obviously doesn't move like he did twenty five years ago. But it looks like Austin, and they loved it. And after he did the both ends of the stage thing, he goes back and he's gone for a while, and he comes back out riding the ATV and circled the ring, and they're chanting and blah, blah, blah. And we knew that they were going to come to some kind of physicality. And let me ask you this before we even get into it. Do you think in hindsight, because if they didn't advertise this as a match, it's probably because Austin didn't want him to, because he didn't want to take the chance on advertising a Steve Austin match and not being able to deliver it. I would think that would be the only reason why they didn't advertise that this was going to be a match. But then he got out there and did it. Should they have called this a match from the start? Would anybody have been upset if they had advertised this as a match through and through and they did the same thing? What we had originally heard was there was going to be a match. And then we heard that Austin thought better of it and that we were going to get this interview segment. The buildup has been atrocious despite some good promos from Kevin Owens, you know what? I don't know how big a difference it would have made. That's the question. If you bill it as the last appearance, the last match of Steve Austin, would it have made a big difference? I will say it was kind of cool watching it get set up and it happening <laughs> and watching Austin's face and just the little moments where the crowd realized, oh shit, we are going to get a match. Like where he said, well, you know, I had my first match in Texas or in Dallas. And then you start realizing, oh shit. Yeah. We may be about to get a match. I'm not going to complain too much. I really enjoyed it. I really liked it. Wasn't a good buildup. But if they were going to try to keep it a secret that he was going to work a match and not bill it as a match, I can't nitpick too much. May, like you said, maybe well, he asked for that. It, it may have been, you know, it may have been a thing where, you know, they vacillated back and forth, but... You know, Austin did a little, verbally, instantly, he was kind of all over Owens. You stupid son of a bitch, and et cetera. And the people were loving it. And Owens had a great line. He said, if if I were you, if I'd been born in Texas, I would have I moved to Mexico. It's right there. <laughs> it 
right down the road. But the premise of how they got into the fight was that Owens let Austin on a, on a secret. He invited him to the KO show not to talk, but to have a fight. And Owen says, even though I have a bad back, I challenge you to a no holes barred match or what? Because he talked about all of Austin's bad body parts. Hmm. Someone may have suggested that to him via podcast a few weeks ago. And he wants a no holes barred match. So Austin, meanwhile, has been letting the heel run his mouth and percolating and with that face. And he started milking the people with the facial expressions as you said and you say well i had my first match in dallas i could have my last match here he said if you want to see me have my last match here give me a hell yeah which they did and then he started to ask give me a goddamn ref and he's he's give me a god and he realized can i say this i don't even know anymore he just said give me a god ref and the ref comes in and the bell rings and here we go it was just so cool, though, because it was in that brief moment where everyone there realized this is going to happen. Yeah. Say hell yeah, everyone does it. He could still pull back. I wish I could, but I'm here just to kick his ass, whatever. When he did it the second time, it was, oh, shit, we're about to get a Steve Austin match. And then it happened. Yeah. And, and also, I mean, he's just so good and he knows he's got the people. Like the one time he said, I tell you what, about 75,000 people in five seconds are all going to be calling you an asshole. And that's and then they say asshole, asshole. He could he could make them you know throw their babies in the fucking lion cage at the zoo if he asked them to. Anyway, they start the slug fest, the mud hole stomp. He shot Steen off, and Steen took the Ray Stevens bump into the turnbuckle. He was pulling out all the stops. Um, let's face it, Steve wasn't he. He wasn't getting his legs up as high. He wasn't getting as much force in the stomps, and he wasn't moving like he used to. But that was, again, 20 years ago. And I've, I've said before, he was so over the mud hole stomp spot. They looked like shit 25 years ago. But because he was so over, nobody could see it. It was snow blindness. It was mass hypnosis. He could do no wrong. Now that they're getting a chance to see him like that and hadn't seen him in so long, he could have done any, he could have been in a fucking iron lung, as Chief J. Strongbow would have said. They still wouldn't have been able to see it because it's Austin. So, and then, by the way, did you notice, unless I am mistaken, unless I had skipped through something and didn't see it, when Owens posted austin and started getting some heat on him and pulled a table out from under the ring was that the first table of this show you know what i didn't even think of it it may have been you may be right uh-huh and guess what stone cold threw kevin owens through the fucking table and i again because he is a major star and knows exactly how this business works i guarantee you that steen is the one who suggested that they do that spot. And then Austin went to all the producers and said, Hey, nobody else use a table. We're using a table and we're the main event. That's what you're supposed to do. So anyway, uh, then they fight out into the crowd over the railing. Brian, was that the first time on the show that anybody had gone over the railing out into the crowd and had a big fight? I believe so. Wow, it's amazing how this works. Because now people are going crazy. Oh, shit, they're out in the crowd. Not, hey, they did that three minutes ago. Owen suplexed Austin on the floor. I wouldn't have taken that if I was a retired multimillionaire movie star, but it's Austin. Big slugfest back to ringside. Austin slams Owens off the barricade onto the desk. That was a fucking hell of a bump. Drank some more beer, beat up Owens on the desk, spit beer on him. Owens gets away and gets on the ATV and can't figure out how to start it, which is classic. And also, I don't know if they have a lot of ATVs in Canada. I wouldn't know how to start one up. But Austin jumps on his back and starts it up and drives Owen to the stage and beats him up on the stage and suplexes him on a stage. And then takes him to the other end and suplexes him there so all the people on the other side of the stadium can see it. And then throws him down the ramp. And if Owens is a combination of a 
human ping pong ball and a, a super ball. One of those rubber ones that boom, it bounces twice as high as when you dropped it. He's, this is his moment. And then finally, Owens hits a stunner and gets a two count just to give him a little more jeopardy there. He gets the chair. <laughs> he swings. He hits the top rope when Austin ducks. Bam, bam, the old bam, bam spot. I first saw that 40 years ago. This was one of the better ones I've ever seen. He fucking nailed it. And as soon as the chair bounces off of Owen's fucking head, Austin's there with the stunner, boom, one, two, three. And it, it, that's what they came to see. And then they had the beer bash and then a second stunner and then more beer. And he called the announcer Byron Allen in, gave him a stunner, had a beer with his brother. Austin is evergreen. He can do anything he wants. He's bulletproof. They love it. Whatever. Bring his brother in, bring his dog, whatever the fuck. So that, that was the way to go home, don't you think, on the first night? I thought there were so many good matches. I shouldn't say so many good matches. There were really good matches on night one. There were some great moments. And the Steve Austin interview segment into the match was incredible. You didn't know you were going to get a match. Even if you were someone who thought you were a few weeks ago, the best is that you had a sneaky suspicion maybe it could happen. And then it happened. And he didn't embarrass himself at all. He was great. The yeah. kicks looked like shit. They always did, but they really did. <laughs> they really looked like shit. But beyond that, it was Steve Austin. And it was the perfect way to end night one. And it was one of the better WrestleMania. Night one itself was one of the better WrestleManias in recent memory. Well, yeah, the, the Miz and Logan Paul match was, was good because of Logan Paul and everybody. But Logan Paul was the standout. Lynch and Bel Air was... Was that the best women's match I've seen in quite a while? Probably. Cody and Seth, to me, was the match of the night. The Austin's business was the, that was the money. That was the pro wrestling angle match segment of the night that everybody wanted to see. The best in-ring match, I thought, was Seth and Cody, which... Again, is when you look at the lineup, is not much of a surprise. And but what may be a surprise, Becky and Bianca weren't too far behind. And then I, I wasn't as hard on Rousey and Charlotte as you were because I went in with lowered expectations based on what we've seen Ronda doing. But people wanted to see it. So, but uh, but overall, like I said, best match: Cody, Seth, best. Segment of pro wrestling, Austin and Owens for night one. I go with Becky and Bianca being the best match, Cody and Seth being the second best and really, really good. I thought Cody Rhodes had a really special night. And the Austin thing was, it was just fantastic. You saw Steve Austin. I mean, we've seen him pop <laughs> up and do different things like give Jonathan Coachman a stunner and different things throughout the years. This was classic Austin now. And it was really cool to see. And, you, you know, part of the problem, I think, and especially on the second night, I started getting this. Everybody that the people really wanted to see are no longer at regularly active, if active at all. The biggest stars, the people they wanted to see, the people they got the biggest kick out of, Vince, Undertaker, Austin, I, you know, Triple H. Everybody that that was, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're seeing, okay, the people live. Oh, my God, we're seeing Vince McMahon and Steve Austin in the ring. That is the biggest money-drawn program of all time. They're also 176, and one's nearly 60. Triple H, even though he just had to retire because of the heart issue, whatever, he's, he started with the company in 1995. Undertaker, the Hall of Fame, the retirement, blah, blah, blah. And then they wanted to see Brock, who's part-time, and uh, really Roman Reigns and potentially Rousey while it lasts because of her mainstream name are the only big-time mainstream names that are there regularly, right? 
if you took the celebrities and the returning veterans off of both these nights, there would have been a lot of people waiting to pop. And I'm just, I, that's not good for regular business or for the future because they've, as we can see, they've run through the Hall of Fames. They've run through the, Vince ain't going to have another match, one would hope. So it, uh, eh.